Okay, uh, so in case you had noticed, I've got a little something on my face right about here. Uh, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, right now, I want to lay some foundation um, about the talk today. So, surveillance capitalism. Um, in case you're not familiar with the term, coined in 2005 by a Harvard Business School professor, na professor named Shoshana Zuboff, um, this is how she defines it. New form of, in of information capitalism that aims to predict and modify human behavior as a means to produce revenue and market control. So a lot of meaning and consequence packed in that definition, and I'll give you some more background on it. Uh, the concept was formed upon and as a reaction to Google's accumulation, management, and processing of immense volumes of data. So 2012, uh, Amit Singhal, he's a senior VP of engineering at Google. Um, he's talking about Google search capability, 30 trillion URLs, 20 billion of those a day, 100 billion search queries a month. This is in 2012. They've, I'm sure they've grown a lot since then. Uh, Hal Varian, 2004, he's a Google chief economist, um, talking about the work they have to do. Create databases that, sorry, store data in massive tables spread right across thousands of machines, querying more than a trillion records in a few seconds. That's complicated stuff, a lot of data to sort through. So Shoshana Zuboff, um, she's got a history of studying uh, capitalism um, for many decades, and so her take on this is that data is becoming everything. Big data is plucked from our lives without our knowledge, without our informed consent, and all of us exist no longer to be employed and served. Uh, we exist to be harvested, harvested for our data. The matrix, we're harvested for energy, and the real world, we're harvested for our data. So there's a lot more to her, to her, uh, to her surveillance capitalism, as she, as she puts it forth. I'm not doing it justice. You should definitely look up um, her, her works on it. All my slides are online. There'll be a link at the end, um, so you can go to see the sources of all my material. Um, so it's, it's fascinating stuff. And for, day, for today, uh, just remember this. Google has shown that big data accumulation and analytics can be highly profitable. And there are many other companies that are desperately trying to follow their business model of collect data and monetize it. So today I want to run through some examples of surveillance capitalism, how it's played out, um, how it's happening in the real world. Any talk on surveillance isn't uh, complete without a bit on privacy. So privacy in the past few years has been a battle, but with a change from privacy being the same as secrecy to privacy being about control. Daniel Solo wrote a paper in 2007. If you got talking about if you got, if, you, if you have nothing to hide, if you've got nothing to hide, um, and he is against the question entirely because most people that you say that if you've got nothing to hide, then what do you have to fear to surveillance to the government watching you? And his take on it is that the problem is in the very question itself. It's the underlying assumption that privacy is about hiding bad things, and it's not. When you ask that kind of question, you're saying what, what bad things are you hiding? And it's not about hiding bad things. Bruce Schne Schneier. Uh, wrote an article on same thing, privacy and control. And in his words, privacy is about secrecy. Sorry, back up. For the older generation, privacy is about secrecy. And as the Supreme Court once said, once something is no longer secret, it's no longer private. But that's not how privacy works, and it's not how the younger generation uh, thinks about it. Privacy is about control. It's about when your health records are sold to a pharmaceutical company without your permission, when a social networking site changes your privacy settings to make what used to be visible to your friends visible to everyone, when the NSA eavesdrops on everyone's email conversations, your loss of control of that information is the issue. So we, we may not mind sharing our personal lives and thoughts, but we want to control how, where, and with whom. A privacy failure is a control failure. Uh, Michelle Den Dennedy is the chief privacy officer for Cisco. Um, extremely smart, extremely positive woman. Follow her on Twitter. I, I highly recommend it. Uh, but interview in January, she said this, when you say privacy is dead, if what you mean that by secrecy and hiding away and not being connected, I agree with you, that part is dead. But privacy as a definition of how we define ourselves, how we live our, our, our culture, how we, and how we live our lives, um, privacy is alive and well. So, okay, a couple things more on privacy. Um, again, just to frame the, the, the talk today, most privacy violations are not caused by a huge personal secret, but by many small things, bit by bit, coming out eventually till it, it overwhelms you. So my opinion on it, uh, privacy is evolving. Privacy is a battleground, and it's a battleground about control, not about whether I control my information on myself anymore, but who controls the data 
generated by and about our lives. So privacy being about control. Um, maybe some of you recognize these pictures. This was a lady caught, caught up in some uh, tabloid style situation a few years ago. Um, she had to go to court and when going to court, people out there photographing her. So to protect her face, she gets a privacy visor like this. Um, it was quite interesting because she's, she's, she's dressing up I mean, she's coordinating it with her outfits. She's obviously looking nice. She knows people taking a picture of her, but she's wearing it to protect her face, maintaining a semblance of, of, of control. And so that's why I wore it today. I wanted to see what it's like. Um, and it's pretty weird. I parked about a block down the street, got out of my car, put this on, walked up here. Everyone's looking at you. It's kind of warm and uncomfortable, but it does put this barrier between me and the rest of the world, like, like kind of like big sunglasses. Um, so being about control, it's... When I want to reveal myself, I can. And it's pretty cool. The visor is like $18 on Amazon. So um, pretty fun things to have. So more stuff on my face. I'll get to this in a few minutes also. Uh, so topics of today, the examples I'll go through. And um, I haven't timed this out. This is actually my first time running through the presentation. I got a lot of material to cover. So I may just go through some examples quickly. But like I said, if something interests you, it'll all be online. Uh, but covering things like instant facial recognition, geofence content delivery, retailer and municipal tracking, location tracking, browser fingerprinting, cross device tracking, um, all the stuff in, the, in the, the, the description, and I have some examples of each. So facial recognition, to give some background, the, 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 there's open source software out there to do it yourself. You can sign up, you can incorporate it into your apps. It's, it's so commonplace now that there's a, a company in Missouri that offers, startup company that offers facial recognition to local businesses so that if you want to go in the store to be a customer, you scan your face. And if you are a known shoplifter, known felon, if you're wearing sunglasses, they won't open the door for you. You have to scan your face to get inside. And this is not like some government thing. This is just like a, a maybe small mid-level store, a retail store. It's been tested for years. Uh, uh, it's being explored all over the world for all kinds of Good reasons, weird reasons. Um, one of the big ones that caught a lot of attention last year, 2016, a Russian startup called FineFace. They made an app. They have, in Russia, there's a social media site called vContact, similar to Facebook. Um, and vContact made the, made the information available to the people who made the FineFace app. So you have an app on your phone, walk down the street, take a picture of someone, and it will find that person's matching profile on vContact. So you at a bar, on the subway, you want to know who that person is and find out about them, you can take a picture and, and get it like that. Um, so with, uh, I think Facebook and Twitter have come out saying that they're not in favor of that, they won't allow that kind of integration. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's a kind of a matter of time um, until these databases of faces are, it's so easy for anyone just all over the world to look up a face right away. It's, it's coming. Uh, one consequence, others don't know how you can see it, but it's Lois Lane on Facebook, and the caption is, do you want to tag Clark Kent and a Superman holding her? So, um, pretty clever comic, but good demonstration of, of what facial recognition can do. Um, and again, the, the, the source, if you go to my slides, you can click on it, and you get the source of the cartoonist. Good stuff. Uh, in the US, these are all US examples. It's mostly, it's, it's in, in Chicago, it's been added to their citywide camera system. Um, FR meaning facial recognition here. Uh, NYC wants to add it to all their bridges to, to get people coming into the city. FBI has been working on a database for years. Uh, there was a big report last year, 2016, that one of two American adults is now in a law enforcement face recognition network from passports, from driver's licenses, from, oh, I forget the other sources, all kinds of, of, of databases that either scraped or sold that people get their consent to, and then the FBI, FBI and law enforcement get a hold of it, and they add it to a much bigger database so that they can compare it to the people walking into a facility. Uh, a big one that I want to mention that gives people a lot of concern, 2017, Taser, the company that makes you know, the, the shock things and body or police gear, uh, they make body cams for police. They want to roll out live streaming for, to body cams by the end of this year, where someone back at the station, at the precinct or whatever, can see what's happening on the police's body cams right then. Um, and next year, they've, they've come out and said this, they want to plug in live facial recognition. So, officer walking down the street, his camera's on, 
scanning faces. If there's a match for a known felon, known person, whatever, he gets an alert, maybe on his phone, some kind of device. He says, hey, look, find this person because of such and such reason. So the concern is you don't even have to speak to a police officer. You walk down the street and you're within sight of one. That's now a police interaction. How is that going to change the, 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 the legally? What's, what's going to be the fallout of that? What, what, what rights do we give up? Um, an interesting take on it is for years people have fought to record the police. You're in public, anything we, you do officers, we're going to record you. Police haven't been happy about that, but it kind of goes, makes sense from a, a, everything's open to the public point of view. Well, now it's going to go both ways. Police can record anyone they see in public and do their own lookup on it. And I, I, I guess I see it coming, and I see uh, unless there's legal protections in place, it's going to be hard to push back on that kind of technology that's coming out. You're in public, it's open season for everyone. So uh, defenses um, against facial recognition, you can wear a mask, um, but actually in 13 states, some states outlaw it completely. I think Ohio and a few others in the South, mostly because come, they have passed laws originating um, in, or against the KKK. Um, I think Ohio, actually, their law says you can't wear a white hood, a white mask, a white cover to the face. Um, a lot of states did just say you can only wear it on Halloween, you can't wear it in the commission of a crime, um, but there's some kind of restriction on wearing a mask. Many countries have restrictions as well, too. So, so max, max, masks as a way to protect yourself are, are kind of right out. A uh, project called CV Dazzle. Um, this was, I think 2014, I, I forget offhand, but um, a, I may get this wrong, Adam Harvey at the time was a master's student, and he, or 2010 out of 2012 is when it originated, I think. Um, he noticed the advancing in facial recognition software. He looked at the open source version called uh, CV something, I'm, I'm blanking on this. Um, but he, he, he essentially figured out how it recognizes a face. You know, it looks for the white space between the nose, it looks for the, the, the distance between where the eyes are. All the rules that the algorithm uses to find, say, this is a face, here's the mouth, here's the eyes, and so on. And he did some, uh, uh, some work into thwarting that. What can you do to stop that recognition from happening? Um, and these are some examples that he came up with, styling the hair to, to cover the, the bridge from the nose, putting um, lines and patterns and stuff, high contrast areas, to throw off that recognition. Um, so that's why I, did, I, I, wanted, I wanted to try it out. I've seen it for a while, it's got a lot of press when it came out. And I'm um, happy to say this morning my wife tried to take a photo of my face, her phone tries, you know, your phone tries to match your face and find it. Couldn't do it. It was like going nuts. Couldn't find my face and it just quit. She tried three times and it, so proof of concept, it works for phones at least. Um, oh, and so I'll go back real quick. Part of his reasons for doing makeup and hair was because you, you can't rely on masks. You can't do crazy accessories. You want to make it kind of fashionable to thwart facial recognition. So that, that was the, the theme behind his project, different ways to throw off the algorithm. And he, did, he had a cool video at, there's a conference in, in Germany called, uh, I forget the name, CCC, um, Chaos Communications Conference, I believe. He had a video, he talked about 30 minutes on it, he's got a cool demonstration of the, of the software actually working, and, and talked about the work he's done, um, and really explains it well. It's, it's super interesting, I, I recommend looking at it. Um, this is a guy who, these are 3D printed face cages. Again, to throw off the algorithm so they can't find out where the eyes are. Um, and he, I, and if I remember correctly, he wanted to make it so that you could print it up yourself and, again, kind of make it acceptable. It's obviously a bit weird, off-putting for some, but think about it this way. If you could have disposable face masks, disposable privacy, essentially, you have a little vending machine with a face mask you buy for the day and then throw away, and the next day you get a new one. Uh, this is research that just, just came out last fall, I believe. Um, and I'll get to talk about this a bit later, but you have these, these, these facial recognition al algorithms, they have, they're comparing a picture to a huge database. What is a known face? What features will match this face? And so they did some research into making glasses. They added a certain kind of noise, certain kind of, of patterns to make someone give a, a return a face that was not the person wearing the glasses. The top row, yeah, the top row of the people wearing the glasses and the bottom three on the right are the faces that were returned as a match. So to humanize, you're like, that's definitely not a match. How is that guy in the, the second to the left being identified as a woman? Um, but to the algorithm, it says, this is that person. Because of the data I'm coming in, the way it, 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 it looks at the data. And it's all just glasses that are custom made. What are even glasses? A piece of paper printed with that, that color pattern. 
Um, this is untested. I love to do this. These are shirts you can buy. They're made big in China, apparently. Um, you can order them, and there's a few other varieties of celebrities with just faces all over them. Like, I'd love to order one of these and see if how it throws off facial recognition software. They're like 15, 20 bucks. I may do it just for fun. I think Will Ferrell wore one on Colbert Show a while ago. Um, ah, okay. Uh, anyone recognize this comic? Comic book? Fans, anyone? Okay, so this is a... I gotta find my notes on this. Okay. Comic strip called the Private Eye. So the premise is, is a story about privacy. Um, this comic book came out two years ago, I think. You can buy it in digital form and on Amazon. It's, it's really, really good. So the premise is, is a story about privacy. In the year 2076, everyone will have a secret identity. Once upon a time, Americans trusted their most precious information to something called the cloud. And whether they knew it or not, this cloud also contained detailed information about their darkest secrets, darkest secrets and most hidden desires. Then, one day, the cloud burst. Oh, let me go back there. No one knew if it was an accident or a declaration of war or an act of God, but for 40 days and 40 nights, the cloud rained down its entire contents across the country. The ensuing flood hurt everyone, digital assets were wiped out, vast online libraries were lost forever. It was a slow and steady leak of indi individuals' personal information that destroyed the most lives. So the premise is everyone's secrets comes out, and the way society reacts to that is there's no more internet, but also everyone wears costumes out in public. Everyone has uh, a persona. When you go out in public, you always cover yourself, and you only take it off in the private of your home or with your friends, and it's all about privacy as control. As you, as you wear these, these, these costumes or these masks, so you can go out and experience new things. You can uh, read about new books. You can go to new clubs, whatever, without people knowing who you really are. Um, and it was just in direct reaction, and it's, it's a cool premise. You know, what happens if, if when the internet goes and, and all the information is out there, how does the world react? It's actually kind of a, a story about a uh, more detective noir story, but that's, that's the backdrop for it. So the um, book is called The Private Eye. You can order it online. Um, it's actually, a, you can pay whatever you want to for it. If you want to get it for free, get it for free. Give them $5, get it, you download it for $5. For $5. Um, the print book you can get from Amazon, and that's also really cool. Okay, moving on. Forgive me if I'm going fast. I'm a bit excited and a bit fun. Um, stayed up a long time doing this, so. Um, like I said, if I go too quick, it's all online. I'll have the, the, the link at the end. Geofence content delivery. So geofencing is, uh, with software, putting an area, kind of a, a digital barrier around a geolocation, say around a city, around one building, and when a device crosses that barrier, something happens. Uh, in the 90s and early 2000s, it was all about location-based tra location device tracking, monitoring vehicle fleets, sending out emergency notifications to every cell phone in the area, really basic, you know, service emergency, it makes sense to kind of do this stuff. 2002, there's a paper that, um, what I found, the first time someone proposed geofencing as a method to identify mobile users and send them con content. Let's find all the people in an area and push out some form of content to them. And 2010, 2012, you start seeing articles online talking about, well, let's use geofencing as an enhancement. Your apps will do something special in this location. Uh, you can, your business, you want to find people in your area who you can market, market to right away because you have a higher chance of getting them into your store. You can find better real estate leads um, looking in certain areas. So um, geofencing as a way to push content out, as a way to interact as, as, an, as an action has kind of evolved over the past 15 years. All in kind of, I mean, it kind of you know, makes sense. You want to uh, sell things, you want to keep track of things. Um, and again, so it, like it's uh, your phone sending out its location, sorry, it's, it's receiving its location via GPS, and you have an app that's monitoring that, and when you pass a certain GPS, you might get an ad that pops up, or a push notification, hey, this business down the street has got a sale on something you like, you should go visit them. So location-based um, actions. Until um, 2015, 2016, so um, this is about abortion, so set aside any feelings you have and just let's take a look at what happened. Uh, an article about, and this kind of sums it up well, anti-choice group uses smartphone surveillance to target abortion-minded women during clinic visits. So, um, I'm going to read a bit. 2015, an advertising executive had an idea. Instead of using his 
his mobile surveillance techniques to find out which consumers might be interested in buying shoes, cars, or some other product? What if he could use the same technology to figure out which women were contemplating abortion and send them ads on behalf of anti-choice anti -choice organizations? The targeting of women seeking abortion presents a serious threat to the privacy and safety of women exercising their right to choose, as well as to the abortion providers and their staff. Um, but due to the laws governing privacy and data collection in the U.S., the conduct was, entirely, was perfectly legal. Um, and there's two articles about it. So essentially, a woman goes to an abortion clinic, which has a location on a map, and because they have an app that, that for whatever reason, is, is tracking their location, maybe through ads or something else, it's returning her location to an advertising company um, he had access to, he could then say, hey, there's a woman with this demographic in this location, I will now push out ads that on the web pages she goes to that might say, thinking of an abortion, there's options. Something kind of innocuous, but uh, there's choices for you. you know, something that you're, you're targeting someone in this location, um, but the purpose was to get them to leave the clinic and, and uh, go to a, a pro-life service. Um, so uh, again, my point of view, no matter how you sit in the abortion argument, debate, um, it's pretty creepy to specifically target someone in that kind of vulnerable situation. Um, as the bottom quote says, it's, they're in a, a private moment, a, a difficult moment, and you're serving them custom ads to get them to go do something to influence their decision. Um, I can see the logic behind wanting to do that if you believe in the, the, the if you're, if you're pro-life and you want to get them out, but the method of doing so seems pretty invasive. So it, it's got some press last year, and I haven't found any other, come across examples similar to this, where someone does this kind of targeting, until uh, Uber. There's an article a couple months or so ago, New York Times. Yeah, how Uber deceives authorities worldwide. Uh, so Uber goes to a city, a city tries to regulate it, find out what they're doing, so they have government code enforcers, regulators, sign up for Uber to make sure the Uber drivers are complying with city code. Um, Uber wants to know this is happening, wants to figure it out, so they have different ways to identify the regulator is, is using their service. One of them, you put a geofence around government offices, when someone opens the Uber, Uber app and requests a ride and they're in that location, that's a high probability they work for the government. Let's keep an eye on them. Uh, Uber did other things, matching the credit card to known city locations, matching the payment details of, of the customers. Um, let me move the mouse, sorry about that. Matching inexpensive cell phone models. They have someone go to stores in the area and see, well, what kind of cheap phones are being bought? Because these are the, the phones that their code enforcers, regulators will probably buy so they, don't, so they don't use their personal phone. What are the cheap phones these regulators are using? What models are they? So when someone installs an app, Uber can say, hey, we have an install matching this phone model. Again, another flag for possibly a government regulator. Um, as well as scraping social media. So um, it was in combination with, with several other things, but um, from Uber's point of view, it makes sense. You want to find out who particularly, which, who's using your app. You set up geofencing to see when someone comes or goes to a certain area. Um, so I haven't seen, this is, this is kind of uh, prediction speculation on my part. But how could this be used maliciously? You work in InfoSec, you start to get that mindset. How could this go wrong? How could I break this? How could I misuse it? And hopefully if you think that way, you're on the good side. Um, but imagine someone using geofencing to do spear fencing, geofishing. Um, mislead someone, show them ads that lead into a phishing website based on their location. Someone voting inside a polling station, inside a medical office, as I mentioned before. Um, inside a domestic abuse shelter, you want to get those women, target those women and find out where they live, who they are, serve them content for whatever not good reason. Or maybe based on a job, you want to target journalists and identify them. Police officers, law enforcement, FBI officers, who's going inside the geolocation of the FBI office regularly? Where are they going? I mean, this is all hypothetical. I, I haven't seen any evidence of this happening, and it'd be cool to try to see if this can actually happen, but knowing phishing and knowing you know, how malicious people work, to me, it's a possibility that it could be used to target people based on their geolocation. So, defense against this, um, disable your location services, don't install free apps that display ads because they usually end up sending lots of data back to the advertising companies. Um, with Android, you can restrict permissions of installed apps that have Android 6 or above. You can install an ad blocker if the websites you, you go to. Uh, uBlock Origin is the one that's most used by people in the InfoSec industry. 
Um, and also situational awareness. Realize, hey, I'm at a doctor's office. Why am I seeing ads on my phone about the, 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 the kind of doctor I'm coming to see? You know, that, now that you're aware that kind of targeting can happen, maybe you'll catch it when it does. So retailer and municipal location tracking. Um, this is usually done through Wi-Fi tracking. You have sensors spread over an area to record the MAC broadcasted MAC address of your phone and what it's like looking for a Wi-Fi hotspot or to connect to. Um, so you have sensors set up and you measure the signal strength, you measure MAC address as it moves across an area and from that you can build up a map of a device's movement through space and time. Um, and I'll have a lot of examples here because uh, I didn't have time to get to this but um, obvious examples are you move through a store, the store wants to know which displays do they go to, where do they stop, how long do they spend in front of a certain display. Um, cities might want to know where the foot traffic is on certain areas. I, I think some companies have sold this to real estate and apartment companies to figure out where the foot traffic is in certain areas, so where should we build, how should we construct our, our cities. Uh, there's a, some research done in the London Underground, the subway system there, few stations, how do people move through stations? Let's track their, their Wi-Fi devices and see how they move. So I mean, it's, it's not to track to figure out where they are, but how can we make the services better? Um, so, and, and again, stores want to do this so they can make their stores better, fix the layout, be more, more profitable, more efficient. So it's not too nefarious unless you, you have a city that say, let's track people that go to a certain area and then find out where they live after that. I mean, you can, again, imagine that the ways it can be misused once you identify a device and then track it over time and use it and, and, and misuse that information. Uh, so the defense, again, turn off your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth when not in use. Um, don't connect to a store's free Wi-Fi because they're going to care about everything you look at, everything you do. They're going to record when you came into that store. An article just came out yesterday, I think, about Mac randomization. Uh, you, I think it was the Naval Academy. Um, I forget who did the research, but they looked at the Mac randomization capabilities of modern devices, Windows 10, Androids, Android phones, iPhones, um, and they all have them. I mean, uh, there was a lot of research last year done into their randomization capabilities, Mac randomization capabilities of devices. And the research that just got, just got published yesterday was that you can, even with devices that broadcast a random Mac address, uh, because of other information that's, brought, that's broadcasted out, other information leaks, the way it's sent out, you can still identify what kind of device it is. You can still de-anonymize it, essentially. So the, the details are interesting from a technical point of view, but the takeaway is devices that offer Mac randomization are not truly random, are not robust, and it can be broken. So relying on Mac randomization, according to this research, is not a way to stay anonymous when you're out and about. Um, and lastly, if you don't like it, just don't go in the store. And, oh, have wear hacks, I was going to mention some of the stores install cameras to, to also track where they go. There's a couple examples of cameras being installed in mannequins to record where people are looking, see how long they look at something, see what their mood is like. Um, so combining Mac, Mac tracking, I guess I could say, tracking the Mac addresses, uh, uh, combining that with, with, with data from cameras, um, again, just to find out what people are doing in the store and how to impro improve it. Unblockable browser fingerprinting. Okay. Um, browser fingerprinting, it's you go to a website and they want to figure out what, what kind of browser you're running. Your browser sends information in the user agent header, uh, what, what version it is, what kind of browser it is, what its capabilities are. The website can, can send code back to the browser. Execute this command in JavaScript to uh, draw an image. And Canvas fingerprinting, what that does, because devices have different GPUs, um, different graphics drivers, different capabilities, different, yeah, different capabilities, there's gonna be variations in how the same image is drawn across different, the same devices sometimes, or it's affected by the browser version and, and, and so on. So you're fingerprinting the device based on what it can do, on, what, on how, it, how it renders a website. Um, and uh, up until, the bottom uh, section, cross-browser fingerprinting, this, that just came out a month ago, a couple months ago, pretty recently. Uh, the, the standard defense was, we'll just use different browsers for things. Maybe Chrome for random surfing. Um, well, Chrome for your banking sites. Maybe Firefox for random surfing, IE for the work stuff. Kind of compartment, 
compartmentalize your habits. So you go to a different place with different browsers and no one can build up a, a solid picture of what you're doing. Um, or install ad blocker as well too. But the research that came out, someone they did some research showing that, again, running code on the computer, looking at all these factors, graphic cards, sorry, let me back up. Again, running code, they get the browser to, to run the same code in multiple browsers, sorry, they get the laptop, the computer to run the same code in multiple browsers, and they do some analysis to say, yep, this is the same person coming back because of such and such reason. So again, you identify the user, even if they're using different browsers to go to the same website. Uh, and there's, all, there's a bunch of websites that, that will show you what information does your browser send back. Um, and most of it depends on running JavaScript, but some of it just is stuff like your window size, um, IP address, the time, um, what fonts are loaded. Um, so if you want to see really how unique you are, any of these websites are interesting, the very last one is, is pretty fun. Click, 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 dot, click. It's a real URL. Uh, it kind of gamifies it. You go to it and, you've, and it's just a blank screen. You start moving the mouse and you have this voice that says, oh, good job. Move to the right. Um, and you say you do something like you click five times, you say, good job, you've, you've clicked five times. And there's like a scoreboard you can see of all the actions you've done. Moving to a corner, clicking forward and back, clicking five times, clicking a hundred times. And it's all done to demonstrate how the, web, or the, the server can track what you're doing, track what your browser is doing, and record it. So it's a way to kind of to gamify, but also show you what is capable of being measured when you go to a website. And the, the voice is, I think, slightly, a few cuss words thrown in there, so I wouldn't blast it at work. Um, but it's still kind of fun to do, just to see, just to see how, what can be tracked. Um, so, defense against that. Um, even more extreme compartmentation. I mean, I don't know how well it would work, but you have a different browser and a different VM. One Linux VM with Chrome, a different Linux VM with uh, Brave, Brave browser, or one with Vivaldi, or one with IE, or in a, a Windows 10 VM. Um, and you have each one connected to a different VPN as well, too. So you're, you're mixing up your IP addresses. I mean, um, it may come to the point where if you don't want to be tracked, that's, these are the extremes you might have to go to to throw out noise about your behavior. Uh, the EFF has a browser extension, the Privacy Badger. Um, it does, I don't know how well it does, but it does attempt to block Canvas fingerprinting um, only coming from third-party sources. You can install an ad blocker that does cut down on some of the tracking you can entirely block JavaScript from running. That's where almost all the tracking comes from, running code in your browser to, to do something behind the scenes. Breaks a lot of websites, but uh, that's why when you use the Tor browser, it, dis it disables JavaScript by default to fight back against some of the fingerprinting techniques out there. Um, or if you don't like being tracked, I mean, some of these defenses I give is just, you just have to get off the internet. If you don't want to be tracked by the internet, don't use it. cross-device tracking and ultrasound beaconing. So, um, again, it's got a lot of press last year. Most of these, this technology I'm going over is pretty recent stuff, has, 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 has matured in the past couple years. Cross-device tracking is IDing the same user across devices. Um, I go to a website on my phone. I go to this website on a laptop. Um, I visit Netflix on TV or eventually IoT devices. You know, uh, I get seen on a camera somewhere and that gets tied to me using the store's Wi-Fi, using their websites, now they've got a picture of this advertising, of this, this user uh, identified by an advertising code. Um, just identifying a user as they move across devices, because many people have multiple devices now and visit websites and services across multiple devices, so advertisers and websites want to know when they're coming back for different reasons, to improve their service, to sell better ads, and so on. Two different ways they do this, probabilistic and deterministic tracking probabilistic, they have a bunch of different data sets. We think this data group matches this other data group with a high enough probability that it's the same person. Uh, deterministic, you log into Facebook on your account on your phone, you log into Facebook onto your laptop, Facebook knows those two devices belong to you because it's determined this user account is using these two devices. Or I sign up with the same email address across different websites and those, the advertisers on those websites know, hey, he signed in here, here, and here, the same email address, it's the same person. Ultrasound beaconing, I send out ultrasound um, audio clips, a sound that sounds that our ears can't hear, a higher frequency our ears can't pick it up, but speakers can. You have a device like a TV, emits an ultrasonic audio signal, 
and it's detected by software, an app on your phone, or a different device. Um, there was a lot of hype about it in 2015. CDT is the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, great organization, great people, really pushing for, for transparency, and they're very pro-consumer, um, pro-privacy. So they, had, they submitted some excellent comments to the FTC about cross-device tracking. They did a great job explaining the technology, the methods, uses, and the privacy concerns. Um, so if you're interested in that, their comments are great. They called out a company called Silver Push, which was not operating in the US at the time, the FTC probably warning about them, but Silver Push essentially was the app that was, the software that was installed in the app so that when an ad comes on TV and someone has that app running and it's listening on the microphone, um, the Silver Push app records that this device saw this ad at this time and it sends it back, kind of as confirmation that an advertisement is being watched or that this person who matches this demographic is seeing these ads. Um, so Silver Push got a lot of bad press. I think they're operating, yeah, they're operating in, in India mostly. Um, not, not in the US right now, last I heard, last I read. Uh, so the, this, there's a website, ubeeksec.org. Some independent research into the ultrasound tracking ecosystem, privacy and security problems, and some proof of concept methods to block it. Um, it's not, it's a technology that's not being widely used yet, but obviously you can imagine, you don't want devices talking to each other, signaling, hey, this person is listening to this ad here without, without your knowledge. And that was a big, the big, big point that the, the FTC made. The tracking often takes place without consumer's knowledge, without your consent and you have limited choices to control it, and the collection of this information results in more and more sensitive data that needs to be protected. So you're, you're generating databases that, that are desirable to attackers. Um, and there have been some companies that, bottom example here, if you do want to consent and you want someone to track you, you're okay with that. There's a company that will install an app and I, I think a, a device over your, your TV as well too to see what you're listening to, but it pays five to $12 a month. That's what they're paying customers to allow themselves to be tracked. Some people do that and they're okay with that. And I guess the, I guess the FTC is too. I mean, that's, that was a big point they made about, about consent. Um, same with some of the organizations that, that, that set standards for the web, that the tracking that goes on, you can do it if you inform the consumer and they, and they give consent to it. So what the privacy laws in the US are, are based about too is, is informed consent of the tracking and surveillance that goes on. So we leave it up to you to decide if you want your activities to be, to be tracked. Um, if you don't like it, you want to defend against it, again, install an ad blocker that, that might cut out some of it. Uh, add noise to your browsing behavior. And by that, I mean not audio noise, but, but um, data to browsing behavior that hides what you're really doing, fake data that you spit out. Um, or maybe you could hope that phone manufacturers will enable filtering of ultrasonic frequencies. It's apparently phones are capable of not responding to it, not admitting to it, but it's a hardware driver issue that phone manufacturers have to build in. Um, I have seen a couple examples of people who want to avoid their microphone, microphone being activated. You plug in a headset that has a little mic on it like that and you break the microphone. When the headset's plugged in, um, apparently the phone will override the external mic and use, yeah, See, oh, perfect, it's even better instead of doing that, so. Okay, that's the same thing. You don't want your, phone, your microphone to be activated, get one of those, go to DEF CON. Uh, data brokers, collection, data analysis, data collection and analysis. Uh, this is a great paper, Data Brokers in an Open Society, came out last year. Um, the definition of data broker, they, as they define it, a company that earns its primary revenue by supplying data or inferences about people gathered mainly from sources other than the data subjects themselves. Um, and it has some explanation about those terms, but um, you know, an information broker. We have information, we collect it from one source and then we sell it to someone else who wants it. I'm not collecting it from you specifically, but maybe from the companies that, that collect it here and there and I aggregate it, that information from them and I sell it off to Facebook, to whoever wants to buy it. Uh, so this article, let me go back real quick. I want to just mention the article linked in here gives a high-level overview of the data brokerage industry. It's, it's super interesting. Um, relevant laws and poly develop, policy developments in the U.S. and the EU. The impact of data brokers and profiling and marketing on consumer credit and policing. And suggestions and questions that the social sector should consider. So um, again, if you want to know about this stuff, the, the group that 
put it out. They're called Upturn. They do a lot of great reports on this kind of, kind of, kind of thing. Um, but it's a pretty established, entrenched process. Data collectors have been going on for, I don't know, decades, 10, 15, 20 years online. Um, and this is another great article about it. You are what you click. The marketing industry is profiling and classifying us all, so advertising can be customized. Thousands of companies are making it their policy and business to profile us in detail, all in the hopes of crafty, crafting better sales pitches. There's no incentive for them to stop this activity. There's no law that prohibit it, it prohibits it. And the growing data databases, a horde, will be difficult to expunge. There's lots of examples of it. A few examples. Um, 2012, this was a really big one. Um, the article linked here is the New York Times, this long form article, talking about how Target does its, its statistical analysis of its data to send ads to people that they think want them. And the, the kind of the theme is, how do you, and it's the premise here, 2002, two colleagues from the marketing department stopped by the statistician's desk to ask an odd question. If you want to figure out a customer is pregnant, even if she doesn't want us to know, how can you do that? And the way it was done is, is you, you watch the buying habits before someone gets pregnant, they start buying certain things, prenatal vitamins. Well, even before they, before they, get, they get pregnant, they, they buy certain things. And once they know they're pregnant, they start buying prenatal vitamins, kid clothes, um, their baby clothes, stuff like that. And so if Target's tracking that and they know this person is buying this, aha, she's pregnant, and this is a big deal. And the article explains it because there's, most of us have our buying habits. We, we know what we like. There's very few times when, when, once we're adult that we start, we change them drastically. And pregnancy apparently is a big one where you'll buy go off in a whole new direction, buying a whole new brand, a whole new variety of things. And so Target's goal was to capture these uh, families, women and men, at this moment when they're about to be pregnant and sell what they want to sell so they can capture these people's interests and make long-term customers out of them. So the, uh, the big thing that caught a lot of attention was that... Um, Okay, I'm a quote from the article. About a year after this, uh, the statistician created a pregnancy prediction model, a man walked into a Target outside Minneapolis and demanded to see the manager. He was clutching coupons that had been sent to his teenage daughter, and he was angry. My daughter got this in the mail, he said. She's still in high school, and you're sending her coupons for baby clothes and cribs. Are you trying to encourage her to be pregnant? Turns out, they weren't. She was pregnant. Target figured that out because of her activity. The dad didn't know it. He eventually came back and said, I'm sorry, I had stuff been going on in my house I didn't know about. Um, but it's, yeah, Target found out that this teenager was pregnant before her parents knew and was sending her coupons because of her buying habits. So, <laughs> surprise, yeah. So, and, and Target changed there. They didn't really comment on that. And the guy, the reporter doing the article, kind of lost his access to the Target guys once that came out and he did some investigating. But, um, and, and they've since changed their marketing and, and, and targeting since then. But that, that was kind of, at the time, it caught a lot of new attention for that same reason. You're just like, I, first of all, people didn't know Target was doing this, that kind of targeting and, and statistic anal statistical analysis. Um, but then when it goes so wrong like that, that's, that's when it makes the news. Um, so a couple other examples. 2016, Gizmodo website started buying Facebook ads targeted to federal employees in Washington, D.C., so, you know, with Facebook, you can send ads based on whatever demographic you like, you know, male, this salary range, this location, with this, with this interest, you can do this micro-targeting. And the point was they made a website, say, hey, you have information about Trump, here's an ad, talk about a website, we want you to leak to us. And that's some pretty specific targeting um, that they were capable of, capable of doing on Facebook. And 2017, uh, Snapchat advertisers, they have access to data from Offline purchases, stats from a loyalty card program, the use of target consumers with relevant Snapchat ads. So it's, it's information that they don't get from Snapchat, they get it from elsewhere. What are you buying in the grocery store? Well, now we're going to serve ads to you, to your Snapchat account, because we know what you're buying in the grocery store. Um, ah, 2017. What, uh, this was an article of research done by Amnesty International, I believe. Why build a Muslim registry when you can buy it? Website called Exact Data, you can go to it. And they have, uh, what does it say? Let me skip down. Boasts a total database of 200 million U.S. contacts, which can be filtered by 450 terms, religion, ethnicity, 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 household income, and vehicle make. So 
Amnesty International, I, I believe it was, they went and they said, they signed up with a few clicks, we want a, a database of people who are Muslim. $140,000 to do that. The government doesn't have to build it. It's already out there, you can buy it. 7.5 cents a person was, was the cost to get that. Um, and there's so many examples, I mean, I, I, I couldn't even list them all in here. There's, it, it's, it's covering every industry, every swatch of life, swath of life. Um, all kinds of examples of, of data collection and micro-targeting being done to find consumers and, and sell them exactly what you think they want, or what you want them to buy. Um, and these are all links to articles, news articles, you can read if you like. So, um, how do you defend against it? Don't install free apps that display ads, restrict permissions, kind of the, the basic stuff again. There's software you can install to install it to keep your apps from connecting out. Buy everything with cash and no one tracks you. Don't install apps. Burn your phone, live in a cave, or just deal with it. I mean, that's, it's been going on for years, long enough that there's, and there's no laws against it. And there's so many companies doing it. That's just the way it is. So it's kind of a first world problem now. Didn't install an ad blocker. Uh, I'm seeing ads that I, I like yesterday across the web. So, um, and I do this to make a point because the, the big hand ring in the US is advertisers are, are tracking us and it's definitely a first world problem as I see it. Like, it's not that critical. It could be misused by the government, but I don't see this most, well, what I've seen, this isn't a huge concern over in many other parts of the world. Uh, a few more examples, biometrics. Um, you can extract fingerprints from a photograph. Biometrics can be faked. Samsung TVs, when they came out, they were always on, kind of like Alexa or Cortana or Siri or whatever Google's thing is. Um, if you don't disable it, they're always listening for their, their wake word. All, EFF, I believe, had an article, always on mics are a privacy threat. Uh, privacy policy is not helpful. 2017, yeah, it was about a month or so ago, a lawyer rewrote Instagram's policy so parents and kids can understand it. And he put it in simple, plain language as a way to help facilitate parents and kids understanding what's going on, but it takes a lawyer to translate that into something that you can talk about. Um, and something I thought was interesting, the very last link, generate a privacy policy for, any, policy for any country. You can go there, it's just like a template thing. What's your country? What's your state? Spits out a policy. And this may be why you see the same policy language on so many websites and so many things. You just copy it and paste and it's not really useful. Um, okay, I'll try to finish up quick. I'm, I'm being close to time. Uh, it's not all bad. I did find some kind of interesting, cool examples of, of AI and, and stuff and all this data collection being used. Um, Syrian refugees, they have access to funds from the UN. The UN had a problem. How do we track and make sure the same person is getting those funds and it's not being stolen or, or misused? So you have ATMs with an iris scanner. You go to the ATM, scan your eye, you get your funds. The UN has a way to audit and track. Yes, this person got their funds, so we can prove that it's going to the right people to the refugees and we can continue funding them because we can audit and track it. Um, 2016, a guy set up a little camera to see when's my boss walking down the aisle? He trained it on the boss's face, so when the boss started walking, his screen would flip up to the code he was doing instead of the website he was reading. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty fun. Uh, an article about Dutch creative art pranksters doing things to, uh, I think the term was dubious devices, like it would, the coffee maker would make coffee really good or really bad based on some social ranking, it would burn your toast or cook it well based on your reputation online. So just devices that, that react to the data about you. Um, and also a, a rave, that, that uh, AI that crafts music based on the public profiles of the attendees. Uh, so with all this fun stuff, how do we fight back? I mean, you can do it on a small scale. Um, and I wish I could talk about these in depth. I mean, all these topics can go on for another hour about each of them, but you can build privacy in. There's companies that are building privacy tech. Um, government nonprofits are researching ways to do it. There's talk in the industry about things like data ethics, um, ethical engineering, building data protection into our laws and regulations. Um, things like data avoidance, the, the, the app Signal on your phone. They received a subpoena, I may summarize this wrong, a subpoena last year about information that was before a subscriber, and they returned like, like two or three bits of data, like an IP address that was signed up, and that was it, like almost no information because they don't collect information. If you, if you don't collect data, it can't be misused, abused, stolen, or subpoenaed. And that's, some companies I think we have to collect everything, but you don't have to, you don't collect it and it can't be, can't be misused. Um, and the Calvin and Hobbes there, it's, it's um, filling out a survey for a magazine, 
So I put in fake information. $500 for my salary, my age 43. Uh, I love messing with data is his, his takeaway. And, and um, as with so many other things, Calvin Hobbes was ahead of his time. Um, but using, putting fake data out there, using false personas, false information, um, throw away email addresses. You sign up for something, don't use your Gmail address. Use a throwaway one, don't put your real name. Um, oh, this is super cool. Adversarial input. input. You have AI. This goes back to the stuff I showed earlier, throwing off facial recognition, those glasses. that like, Once you know how an algorithm works and you know how to thwart it, well, you put out fake information that gives wrong answers, or you, or you submit an image that has enough noise in it, so say it's an image of a panda, but the AI machine learning whatever recognizes it as something else entirely because you've altered the image in such a way as to throw off its, its, its recognition capabilities. Uh, so adversarial machine learning, adversarial inputs, this is all, if you're into AI and machine learning and big data and neural networks, neural networks, this is all super interesting stuff that's just now coming, maturing, I guess, in the past year or so because for so long the, the push for AI and machine learning has been to make it good enough to work. Now that it's working, they have to start worrying about, well, how will people give us bad, bad data? How do we know when it's correct? How can we test that we're getting the outputs that we want? Okay, so to kind of close up here, on the present surveillance, what are we worried about? Uh, the government's spying on us. Government's everywhere. You know, we're being watched all the time. Um, and this is kind of a, a reality check that I saw. This was, um, let me read this off. So this was a news article from here in KSL, here in Utah, a month or so ago. A five-year-old child reported being sexually assaulted after entering a bathroom at a library. Surveillance video shows a man whom libraries employees say frequently visits the building, following the boy into a restroom. Man leaves the bathroom. Boy comes out and tells his sister and mother what happened. Absolutely horrible. What do they have? This is the surveillance video they have. And this is the kind of situation where you want facial recognition. You want to know who this guy is, identify him right away and catch him because of the horrible thing he's done. So this is the, 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 the balance we have to worry about, the trade-offs we have to worry about, where we want protection um, for situations like this, but we don't want to give up the control we have over our, our privacy and our personal lives and data. And so it's this, this constant tension that's going on that we saw played out, for example, last year with the FBI trying to get into the Apple's, Apple phones. Um, does Apple allow, they break their encryption for some cases, not others. There, there's victims of crimes where uh, a son or a daughter is murdered and the parents and the police want access to the phone to get information, but Apple wouldn't release it. I, you're on the side of the parents there. Like, so you're, you're a parent, you want the police to solve the crime, and you want to get the device that has information about it. Um, but people on the side of, the F of, of Apple against the FBI, they want to do something, get special access to the FBI because of all the, the reasons that entails. Um, so again, just at, uh, doing the research for this talk, I saw this article and just like, this is a time where you want that surveillance to be there. Um, but this is the hype that most people worry about. We're going to be watched all the time, it will be abused. So how do you find the, the balance between the two of them? Um, and I don't know. I've had some good conversations with, F, with FBI agents about their opinion is, from ones I've talked with, their opinion is let the people decide because it's not up to us to decide. It's, and um, likewise, people in the tech world, in the security world, they're as little control for government, as little surveillance for the government as possible because they assume it will be misused. Um, but that's outside the conversation, or the topic today, again, we're just talking about surveillance capitalism, about how data collection is happening, how it's being monetized, and it's been going on, maybe you don't know about it, hopefully this will open your eyes some. All my slides are online, slides.securutah.org, lots of cool links, lots of stuff, there's so much I couldn't go into, so much is interesting stuff going on out there, so I'm happy to talk, answer questions, um, don't take my photo. Um, all right. Thanks a lot, y'all.